science. We get experimental yes. science. We're curious, non judgmental. So chat, this study is on sea fireflies. I've never heard of sea fireflies before, and I thought that was kind of cool. So sea fireflies are a type of ostracod. Ostracods, if you don't remember, we see every Monday on Microscopy Monday when we look at pond water. I can't remember how many times we've done pond water and not found an ostracod. They are a very, very common animal that we identify in our pond water samples, which I think is super, super exciting that we're able to have something like that, right? And so they are tiny crustaceans. They're the size equivalent of a sesame seed. And this is what gets me. They don't at all look like any kind of firefly but here they are this is what they look like and so they have this luminescence now why they're called sea fireflies i think it's most likely to do probably the size of the animal is like no not too dissimilar in size from a, an adult firefly and then they also have like this pulsing light in the water same way fireflies have in the air and that's most likely why they're called that again i didn't look into like the origins of the name of these animals but if i had to guess Yes, that's where it would come from. So it's a neat feature, presumably why they're named that. So the males are the interesting ones in this. They have these bioluminescent pulses of light and that attracts females. Now, what's also interesting is that these bioluminescence that they release, it's not just their bodies that glow like a firefly. Instead, they release vesicles of protein that bioluminesce. And so, and it's from a particular gland of the animal. And so what we think is actually going on is that there's both visual information and possibly like in the water olfactory information so smell that they're driving females towards this side but they're releasing essentially like a small package of protein that starts to glow and it's like this gooey substance and that's what the females start coming towards them to end up mating with the animal now th what's weird too to me Ian is that the females don't interact with that protein packet right it's not like the sperm are contained there like here we've released this glowing bag of sperm come get it if you want to be able to have mated no no no. it's that all is a means to attract the female to the males and so it's like it's interesting that that is released and it's very different method right than the fireflies and so that's why the hypothesis though unproven is that there must be some kind of either olfactory cue or even gustatory like maybe there's some kind of chemo sensation through the water that's released like almost when the animals are filter feeding there's like a taste of it as well like it's not actually known what this paper looked at was the pulsing of the light and if it's synchronized or not or if it's asynchronous meaning these animals are the males acting together to attract the females or are they acting separately do they release their little protein packet that glows by themselves off in the water randomly somewhere or usually the crazier of the two hypotheses is that right they cluster together one starts releasing this packet then the others do as well at the same rate and so you see pulsing flashes of light, which then would make it so that the females are more likely to find you. They're essentially working together to get the female's attention. And that kind of collective group behavior is not common in the animal kingdom, especially when it comes to mating. Because the idea is if you try to mate, right, and you have too few individuals, like too few females, then if you're competing for a mate, you don't want to pull in other competition. Wingmen, but Smikes, these wingmen are also mating, right? So it's not that one one is some are sacrificing the likelihood of mating, but rather they're working collectively to get female attention. And that is weird. It's not standard for it. So the way that researchers describe it is that there's this little glowing ball of mucus that's released and they make it analogous to a Morse code in the water. And so it's they flash in these repeating constant patterns and there's a trail of them. And so because the, as the water is moving and washing away way the sample it starts to make almost like a sea of stars in the water which i think is really cool these ostracods were first discovered in 2017 so it is a relatively new species of ostracod and it was discovered in panama is where these animals have been and it seems like there are a lot of animals these microorganisms in the caribbean area that have fluorescence ability and so it just not surprising that that's where this ostracod was identified and actually the 
the lead researcher on this paper has been studying bioluminescence since the 80s. So what? why the researchers started this study in the first place, they had these ostracons in the lab because they were studying what the bioluminescence genes may be, or like trying to get on that. And what they noticed was that this mating event that they're seeing only happens when the moon is not bright in the sky. So there is a built-in circadian rhythm for them in these animals based on the lunar events of whether or not they're going to be releasing these glowing packets of protein to attract the females. And presumably it's because if there was the full moon overhead, it would not be as visible, these glowing factors, as if there was just complete and utter darkness. And that's kind of wild to me that they were able to actually pick up that in the lab. They didn't go into like what the lab setup was where they were, they noticed something like this. So this is time in terms of how many dots you're seeing. And this is just on a dark dish. It's like a Petri dish, not that much water. And apparently so they were mentioning in the study that this is a biologically significant depth, meaning that because one argument you can make Ian right off the bat is if they were deep sea animals, if you're doing the experiment in a dish, they might not be getting getting the necessary signals that they are where they're supposed to be so like pressure differences temperature differences the amount of light that's coming in etc that's associated with living in deep sea these are living much closer to the surface and presumably that's why they're reacting to the moonlight versus if they were really deep sea they might be very gucci gucci but also the moonlight might not actually affect them and so this is just in a, a petri dish they're trying to demonstrate the same kind of situation that the animals would be in they're not simulating waves mind you, but they are looking over time how these dots are moving. What I really like about this figure too is that it shows you time. These dots here that they've zoomed in on, that first dot was the newest release. That one was the second US and this one was the first. So you can see how they're moving away from the animal. The animal is not marked here, right? This is what's weird to me, Ian. The animal does not glow. The animal is not the thing that's bioluminescing. It is in fact the little protein packet that they're releasing, which to me comes up with a whole other series of questions. In particular, why is that, right? Like why is the animal not fluorescing? What is happening to the molecules in that protein packet? Like my guess, Ian, and this is total conjecture. If it's not glowing in the animal, that must mean that the bioluminescent molecule is not active. That must mean when that protein packet is formed, I would guess that two vesicles fuse together to get everything together into one vesicle so that everything can react is my bet. And so I would be interested in seeing where in the body these elements are compartmentalized in the ostracod. Like what is keeping these animals from having the bioluminescence to begin with in the whole animal? So then where are you sequestering certain enzymes and proteins in the body? to be separate and then you fuse them together. Now, the nice alternative is to suggest like, hey, maybe you wouldn't wanna glow all the time, right? If you glowed all the time, predators might get you. If you have something like this, then you're only glowing when it's mating season and maybe it's not as energy costly. And so I can see the evolutionary justification of why the fitness might be better at that particular range. And it's just, it's confusing and definitely more testing is needed. In this study, all they really looked at and demonstrated was that the male are essentially working in unison with this study what else did they do so they mentioned that these like glowing packets that you see here what's very unique about them is that they last for a long time they're pretty bright and the amount of fluorescence that they're releasing is pretty dense and that's again demonstrating because the males are working together to be able to do this the story that they mentioned is he was like well i like diving and i went diving in the caribbean and i saw a cloud of them as i was swimming and I was like, well, that's kind of cool. And so I guess that maybe got the researchers to start looking into these organisms. You might be wondering y'all like when or ever did these animals share an ancestor with fireflies? So right again, we like, why are they called sea fireflies? Is there any evolutionary connection to them beyond or is it just that there it's a cute name if you look back at the the genetic data and like the predictions on the phylogenies it looks like they shared an ancestor about 500 million years ago is the most common ancestor with fireflies and ostracons but they did point out in the paper that that shouldn't be met with that that's when the evolution of biofluorescence for mating occurred they're pegging both the evolution of biofluorescence for mating in fireflies and in ostracons about 20 million years ago so even 
though they shared a common ancestor 500 million years ago, both animal species independently evolved biofluorescence for mating, which is kind of cool. Again, what they pointed out was that they haven't been able to prove why there's this synchronization of the release of these vesicles. So again, you're seeing here, there's many of these vesicles being released at a given time, and that's what's attracting the females. I wonder if more fit males have brighter pack. Yeah, so Ian, that's something that hasn't been studied. Because exactly, Ian, like it might not be working together, right? It might be you're taking advantage of these other males that are better, right? And so working together, you're kind of just kind of working together, but not really, right? You're taking advantage of a good situation. And that might be what's actually happening here. It's like they mentioned, they didn't find, nor did they prove that it was a collective behavior to necessarily be more efficient at mate collection. The experiment for that would be pretty straightforward, right? You'd have a large tank of water, you'd have a male that would be pulsing these protein packets by himself, and you put females in the tank as well, and then you have a second tank where you have a lot of males that are pulsing the light, and then you have the same number of females in there, and presumably the, the males are more likely to mate if there's a bunch of them pulsing light, right? But that, like you said, doesn't answer the fitness question of variance between males and or the likelihood that they mate. So this is maybe a level of complexity that maybe ostracods, it would be difficult to test. But one thing you would test is like if you had that in a, an insect system, and I know I keep coming back to insects because I mean, that's where my expertise is. So that's where I can comment on how you design that experiment. But if you you had the question of like for fruit flies they had a preference for particular kinds of mates like fitness for males you can give them a choice experiment to give them the option of choosing this male or this male that they mate with and then you could try to correlate with well what feature is it that they were detecting i'd be interested to see if you can do that with an ostracod female of give her you know a brighter shining light like a brighter protein packet male and see if she prefers that one over the other but maybe that's like the next step glowing dude sperm sack stuff okay and just so we're clear these glowing ostracods they release a protein sack that's glowing to attract females on over the density is not taken into account the video versus on this data so that's why you're having that but i think the video is really cool in that we can see that bioluminescence and so these they are releasing here that bioluminescent goo here is just so they're just population they're so dense that it's just everywhere and so presumably these are the males that we're seeing as well or at least the ones that are glowing and you can see though it's not the actual animal like you see here as it's filling up the gaps in between that's that release of that fluorescence it's a means by which maybe we can identify more of them so gk this one is super weird like with the biological advantage to this luminescence so there's a lot of overall advantages. There can be mating, like attracting a mate via like if you're in a dark area, right? Like if you're deep in the ocean depths, finding someone, or if you're just like a firefly out in the wild, attracting a mate. Also, it's a sign of fitness, right? Like if you can glow brighter and you're not eaten by someone, it's a trade-off, right? Because if you're bioluminescing, you might also be attracted to predators. But if you live long enough to mate, then that shows that, you know, you're, you're more fit, right? So there's that element to it. There's also communication outside of mating that could be important. There's also hunting. If we think about deep sea or organisms right like the the angler fish the right they use bioluminescence to attract potential prey so there's like there's both right you could be eaten by having for having bioluminescence or you could be doing the one doing the eating and so those these different means of doing it now here in this study it's really weird it's for mating but what they say is it's only the males that are doing this and they don't do it individually so imagine that there's this you know big body of water because they're in the ocean of the caribbean and the males start releasing these little glowing protein packets but not by themselves because if there was just one male in the water releasing this protein packet that ends up glowing i mean you would get something like in this figure here a couple of glowing dots and essentially the reason they suspect that it's being released is so that the females will come find them and mate with them it totally makes sense that's usually what these things are used for but the hypothesis is that in a giant body of water if you're just one male by yourself and these are really small animals if you're releasing like only by yourself like no one's gonna find you and so it seems like the males act together so this is multiple males you don't actually see the animals the animals themselves don't 
bioluminesce. It's only these little protein vesicles that they release that actually end up glowing. And so you can actually track over time all the, the newest signal versus the oldest signal. You can even see like how they're decaying with light. And what were they, the researchers found was that these groups of males synchronized as they were releasing these pulses. And so it's almost like Morse code in the water to make sure you're getting the female attention. Now, literate Ian pointed out, and I think this is a very important question of like, well, then who who gets to mate, right? If there's enough females where it's not a competitive issue, then maybe it's not, a, it's not a thing to wonder about. But if there's more males and females, then there's gonna have to be other factors at play, right? Because if you get all the females over, then who's the male that would otherwise be mating? If they didn't, they weren't able to address this. And what they showed in the study was that they synchronized and started releasing these vesicles to attract the females to come over to that site and the males are working together and that's a very unique behavior that we tend not to see like this cooperation anyway in the wild but seeing it in these on like for a reproductive scale is really not seen and so it's not just that they're wingmen as kennedy said it's that everyone in theory is going to be able to make like you're asking like well what's the evolutionary benefit here cooperation can help but again where i get stuck on in this particular paper is why like they're working together like what is what's the next step like who get, does everyone get to mate is there like a fitness hierarchy are there males that are brighter and therefore more fit are there males that are less bright and less fit is that even something to consider uh they did say in the paper like we don't know which i kind of liked. like i i appreciate that it's a we don't know kind of thing if you're releasing these glowing things in the water will that attract predators and ostracods get eaten by a lot of stuff the luminescence is already glowing before it fully left the body yeah yeah so literally and that's my hypothesis they did not talk about it in the paper of what exactly is the feature that they're like looking at but because the animal itself doesn't naturally glow, my assumption is that it is two different molecules that are come together, and that's what's giving you that glowing of uh, uh, that fluorescence. And so, Ian, what makes that difficult is we don't know what the internal elements are that made this happen, right? So you would have to go in, and I think you'd have to do some sequencing and actually analyzing the individual elements within the animal and seeing if the compartments, what what is the composition of those compartments?